Okay, well, hello everyone and welcome to our artist talk today. This is number two in our series for our HOPE exhibition and I'm really excited to hear from these artists today. It's going to be a really great artist talk. All right, so I am Katie Bradford Osborne. I am the founder and curator at Roaring Artist Gallery. What we're going to do is we're going to do a super quick little run through of our HOPE exhibition. We will just be stopping at these artists art, which means we will just be in one room for <laughs> the exhibition today. And um, so if you haven't seen the exhibition yet, it's going to be running through October 31st, 2020, 2021 um, um, in our 3D gallery space. So if you haven't seen it yet and it's not October 31st yet, go and check that out. But if it's after October 31st, it will probably be a tour on YouTube. So you should check that out anyway. All right, let me screen share and we can. Okay, can you all see my screen? are in our HOPE exhibition. Okay, we're going to start at Rita's Rainbow Rain piece. This piece by Rita Patel. This piece has been in our gallery for a little while. Rita is a represented artist, so this piece is available through our gallery, and I just think it's so beautiful. I'm excited to hear more about your process, Rita. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. I'm looking forward to sharing it. Thanks. <laughs> You're fine. Sarah's piece over here. A Phoenix installation. I have to say, this is one of the, I think, coolest pieces that we have had sculpturally in the gallery. I am so excited by how it turns out. Thank That's you. Really cool. I'm excited to hear more about this piece too. I absolutely love the concept. I think as soon as you get the name Phoenix, it's like you can sort of get what it is, but I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to hearing more. All right, and here's Mackenzie's tricks. Never trust a southern groundhog. And Mackenzie, I need to hear, I need to understand about the names. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I absolutely love this piece. All right. Okay. Well, I'm going to launch in. Sarah Bus Camp is up first. And all right. Okay, so I have to do my screen share here. Just a moment, let me read your bio. Oh yeah, right. And then you'll be ready to go. All right, born in 1985 in Los Angeles and raised in Austin, Sarah currently resides with her husband in Germany. Loss and suffering, two inescapable aspects of the human condition, have been long-standing themes in Sarah's work. Reoccurring themes in her work also include wanderlust, loneliness, home, longing, and hope. She uses her art to grapple with the intertwined experience of hope, both within and in spite of anguish and lament. I love that. All right, Sarah. Okay. So. I think we've got this here. Do you guys see my screen? Yeah, you're good to go. Okay, good. So I'm Sarah Busca. And um, yeah, so I'm an American living in Germany. Um, do a lot of, have done a lot of traveling, live in several different places. So that definitely comes into my work as part of my bio as well. And um, <clears throat> I'm also really into movement. So I'm a Pilates and yoga instructor and that also plays into some of my work. So you'll see as I'm creating my process. So this is just a bit of background for you guys. Um, so it was already said in the bio, a couple of my themes. And so a lot of the themes that are reoccurring through all the different bodies of my work would be wanderlust and the German word is fanweh. 
Um, and that kind of holds a lot of this wanderlust, this desire for something more. But that also ties into longing and searching. So this searching for something. Um, uh, and that also is like a coming home. So Heimweh is this longing for home. Uh, and I think that also has a lot to do with hope. We all have a hope within us for something better, something where there's restoration. Um, and that, of course, is juxtaposed in our lives with, with loss, with lamenting, with mourning. Um, there is a lot of suffering in our world. And I think it's important um, as artists to deal with these topics as well, because they are um, very, very relevant and pertinent to the human condition. Um, and then nostalgia and memory also come up. So I was just going to show you guys a bit of my painting work. I do primarily painting, even though it was a sculptural installation that was shown, shown in the exhibit. Um, and I work in all sorts of different sizes and mediums. So you'll see some here that are oil, as well as some that are acrylic and mixed media. And I think it's probably helpful now that you've had some of the themes, you can maybe see how some of these um, ideas and concepts are coming through in the colors, in the line work, in uh, just the arrangement of some of my forms. And also there's a lot of gold that I use and that's often the hope aspect. Mm, so I really like to use uh, oil pastels with gold to do some fine lines. Um, I do abstracts as well as landscapes. So landscapes are really important to me as humans. We are continually in landscapes um, and they shape our experience. So this is just to give you guys an idea of the overall portfolio. Um, a lot of movement in my work. So you can see a lot of the broad strokes. I often paint with my hands as well. And I'll show you a couple of videos of that coming up. Um, so again, that ties into my love of movement and using the entire body. Um, so I sometimes use both hands as well to create. And it gets pretty messy. So I love, um, working with found materials, um, as well as buying materials from my local art store. Um, so my studio in process, I have a studio at what's called the Leipzig Baumbosch Spinnerei, and it is a old cotton spinning mill. It's one of the biggest in the world. And it's got these gorgeous old buildings. And there's a lot of artists there. So it's a really great place to be. So this is my studio currently, or not exactly currently, but recently. And then this is some of me working. So you can see it's a lot of up, down, side to side. Definitely very active. I'm often listening to music, can be caught dancing. I work with a lot of layers. When I'm doing mixed media, these are both mixed media. And so I build it up with a lot of different layers. It's acrylic and then charcoal and oil pastels. And these are the two finished paintings that you just saw the process work on just for the idea of what it turns into. The one on the right probably had five, six, seven layers underneath it by the time I was done. So they have kind of a life of their own. Here's some more glimpses into the studio. I, like I said, it gets pretty messy. I am actually a very orderly person. So my home is very, very clean and that it's really important for me to have my studio space where I can just leave everything messy so I can actually let go, let loose. Um, I guess a lot of artists can relate to that. <laughs> and I can leave all my stuff just everywhere and come back to it until it gets too chaotic and then I have to clean it up because I can't even get to anything. Oh, well, you get some music. <laughs> These are some of the Instagram posts I have made in the past. Um, I like to do some of the time lapses, just again, because to me, it's kind of a dance that I'm doing as I'm painting. 
On the left, you can see where I'm doing the two-handed painting. Um, that started for me because I've had a lot of shoulder pain on the right side and a lot of wrist pain. And there was times it was really painful for me to do my right-handed painting. And so I started to decide, okay, I'm gonna start, start doing my left hand. So I'm gonna make the best of it and see what happens. And different kind of lines come out, a different quality comes out when you're working with your non-dominant hand. And um, then I thought, well, what happens if I'm doing both hands at once? And then there's gotta be a lot more intuition happening. So I do a lot of intuitive painting, um, expressive intuitive painting. And that's one of the ways that I do that and kind of push myself. Uh, recently, the last exhibit I had um, was at the same space where I have my studio and it's with 19 other international artists. And there's, in case you guys are curious, they also have an online exhibit, dry um, slash Ausstellung, point, uh, uh, point online, sorry, German there. <laughs> um, and I was 40 weeks pregnant at the opening. So that was very exciting. It was kind of this, you know, which one's gonna come first. And the Phoenix had made it into this exhibit. So that's my husband and my parents say where I would make it to the baby and swim on hand on me. Um, and that was the big colorful piece is one of my pieces. Um, it's actually quite big. These rooms are really massive, so it's hard to get a scale for it. And this is a little close up of that Phoenix. This is just the head that I decided to include in this uh, exhibit, partially because I was 40 weeks pregnant and building the installation was a bit much. <laughs> And there's another one of my pieces as well, made with two hands and lots of that line work that I have, that gold that for me stands for hope um, is in there as well. So I do use a lot of the darker colors uh, because I do deal with the concept of it, the um, themes of lament, mourning, loss as juxtaposed against hope and uh, a desire a longing for a home that we have built into us and a desire for beauty and restoration and wholeness. Uh, I think that's in every human part. Uh, but last year in particular, I dealt with a lot of um, lament topics and lamenting, I think people can sometimes think, oh, that means just being sad. But for me, it's um, actually just mourning um, without losing hope. It's going through the process of, of mourning and grieving something so that one can actually have hope and move forward. So I did a exhibition for that. And personally, I had uh, lost a pregnancy and had a couple surgeries that year, lost a good friend to suicide. Of course, there was Corona happening in the world. There's a lot of stuff going on. So for me, it was a really hard year of stuck in some depression. Um, and that's where a lot of this work came out of was this personal experience. Even though these themes have actually been themes that I have been dealing with for several years, the last year it really came home to me personally. And this Phoenix was something I created for my friend who um, took their life. And uh, the Phoenix is a mystical um, bird creature that, uh, keeps dying and reincarnating. Uh, so it, it keeps um, burning up and then it comes back to life. Um, so it's the symbol to me of never giving up hope, um, even though there is suffering in it because it's the dying and living again. So it's not saying that life is just cheery and everything will go perfectly well. So there's kind of this bittersweetness to it. Um, and I found that picture to really resonate with me. I used found objects for it. So you'll see there's shingles, there is wood, uh, there are ashes uh, because of this burning, uh, the phoenix burns. Um, and it's kind of, I made it so that you're not sure, is it taking off? Is it coming back to life? Or is it actually in the process of dying at the moment? Um, but to me, he's looking up. So there is this like hopeful upward trajectory. Uh, it's quite big. Uh, again, these rooms are really big for this, uh, this exhibit, exhibit hall. So you can probably get a feel, I think on the far right, you can see a little person standing next to it. Um, and this is something I've written in the time. Uh, oh, I can't read it because um, it's in front of, 
hmm, I can only see your faces. Okay, but you guys can read this. You should be able to move the um, thing too. If you like click on the top of it, I think you should, you can move it. I can't find my cursor. I think that's part of my problem here. Oh, there we go. Okay, wait. There we go. Okay. In the darkest moments, I was aware of God's nearness in a way I had never experienced. I didn't receive the answers to my questions why, but I did receive comfort. No pat answers or silver linings, just the original meaning of comfort, the word, with strength. Strength to go on living and to trust in spite of not understanding. I did not triumph over adversity, but rather surrendered to the inescapable human practice of lamenting. And I have a quote there that guided a lot of my work. Sorrow, however, turns out to be not a state but a process, and that's from C.S. Lewis. So there's another view. These are some of the pieces I was putting together. So I think it's always interesting, especially this kind of work to see how it came together. There was all sorts of found pieces of wood that I found while we were out hiking in Slovenia um, on vacation right before, and I was really struggling with some depression. And so we went out to the mountains and I found all this wood out there. And I didn't have this plan for this phoenix before, but I kept finding this wood and I just kept seeing this phoenix form and felt like, okay, there's a phoenix taking, taking shape here and just kept collecting this wood. And each piece I would see like, there's an eye, there's a feather uh, until I had this massive pile <laughs> of wood. My husband was like, oh boy, I don't see how this is gonna be a phoenix, but okay, <laughs> we'll give it a try. Um, so this is also a time lapse of me putting it together. It was very precarious, um, but I had a lot of hope that it was gonna work and it didn't work. So that was another aspect of me. I was like, no, I'm gonna make this as kind of a statement um, that I'm gonna make it through this time. It arise again out of the ashes. There was another installation I did and it's called the wind telephone it was based off uh, some work by a japanese artist and the concept is that you can dial a deceased a loved one and talk to them um, and so you can see it goes nowhere but it's actually a therapeutic process um so i thought it was kind of interesting but there is a glitch so i made a big catalog for this with a lot of my writings and a lot of other writings that inspired me during this time for uh this exhibition um and i really like the way the book turned out because it's kind of a, a art project in and of itself with all the quotes and the writing um so it's just kind of an experiential piece the full um exhibition was called 2020 beta release which is to be expected because i felt like 2020 just went wrong like somebody didn't do enough trial runs they're creating it like maybe god could have taken one more run around um but yeah so that was kind of a joke for me and the title but ironic and this is me taking it back down installations are of course temporal uh so they're really just this this lot of work that you do for the one space and then you take it away again um and in that sense it's kind of reflects human fragileness uh, we're here for so short um, and we can make the most of it. So that was one more quote that was with this exhibition about grief. So just gonna scan through some of these. These were performance art that I had done for it. Um, was also working through the process of grief and mourning. And then at the end, coming back to um, hope. So we ended in the end of this, two of my friends were playing music, uh, professional musicians. And some of the music started out, there was a lot of sadness, but it was woven in with a lot of positive um, notes of hope by the end of it. Um, and we wanted to, to reflect that, that there is uh, grief and mourning, joy comes with the mourning, the other kind of mourning, there is light at the end of the tunnel um, and hope while not talking down some of the hard things that do exist. So this is another way that I used movement. Um, for me, it was a personal cathartic process. 
I'm gonna look at my time. I feel like I'm probably giving you guys way too much information because it's a short artist talk. <laughs> but I'm almost done and I'll take questions. So my current projects, there's one big one and that's my uh, Lily and she is nine weeks tomorrow. So uh, if any of you have children, you know that that's a very big project that for right now is taking up most of my um, creative outlet energy. <laughs> Uh, but it's also giving me a lot of uh, creative um, new force, new life into it. And I'll also be working probably on some more detailed pieces. So you can see this piece actually finished behind me, uh, not in the entirety. So I also do some of the more, not exactly realistic, but more detailed work as well as that expressive kind. But this kind of work is more manageable for a home studio. Um, and probably for having a small child. So I'm kind of embracing having a different uh, process uh, coming up. And as well as during the pregnancy, I couldn't paint with my hands with some of the materials that I was doing before. Uh, and so I had to go back just to paint brushes. And so then I would kind of begin some of this type of work. So I'm curious to see what comes out now in this next season of uh, mothering, as well as paperworks. So paperworks are also much more manageable for me. I can do that at home and there's not as many toxic chemicals to and time and other things and then this is just my contact info if you want to check me out for curious like really there instagram and then my website so yeah so i am happy if this happens to be any questions i'm happy to take those Do we have any questions for Sarah? Well, I really enjoyed that. I'm so glad that you showed all of your paintings and your painting process as well. I think that was um, that was a really cool thing. It's always interesting whenever we have one medium in a show. One of the reasons I love to do these artist talks is because I love to see everything that an artist does. But I think it's really fascinating how you went from the way that you paint into the way that you put this particular installation together. I saw a lot of crossover for the way that you work and that was really, really interesting to me. Yeah, yeah I'm hoping to do more installation in the future. Um, yeah, just need some spaces for it. Mm -hmm. That's the thing with installation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you kind of have to have a reason because um, I like doing it, but it's kind of hard. I'm not going to build a big installation in my living room just for myself. Mm -hmm. Do you think you'll continue in working with found objects like the um, natural objects and things like that? I would really like to. So being outdoors is a huge thing for me. And I really would like to. I enjoyed that enormously. So if I could continue that. And I kept all the wood pieces. I've kind of played with the idea of this phoenix actually being reincarnated as it were into a different form, different, different way, different shape, um, using some of the pieces again, some of the shingles. So yeah, I've got one piece in uh, one place in Leipzig coming up that I might be able to do an installation in. It's just been due to Corona, there's been some, um, lots of things closed over here, so. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm excited to see what comes out with that for you. Well, if we don't have any other questions, we'll go ahead and move forward. But Sarah, thank you so much. Actually, you. actually, I have a question. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, in the installation, which I found all your pieces very powerful, but that was very moving. Uh, um, the pieces that you collected for it, did you know why you were collecting certain pieces or it just kind of all came together? Um, it really there was a there was a couple pieces where it looked like an eye or it looked uh like it could fit for a beak or something but a lot of it just came together it was very serendipitous um in that sense like i just had really this 
box by the end of the week of these pieces and they all just had this feathery look kind of wood there was just this really uh interesting texture so they all looked like feathers um and looked like organic shapes um, but not every piece was clear to me yet what it was going to be it was only once I got there in this space and just gave myself a couple days to just be with the pieces and let them kind of speak to me and and find their way to each other Thank you. So it's so much about the process is unknown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. The, the work is really stunning. And I like your um, interest in language as part of it, too. Um, mm. Curious to see more of that. Was the first time you put that installation together actually in that um, gallery environment? It was, and it was one of those things uh, that we came back from vacation. I had eight days, I think, to set up for that show because it was kind of, it was a very chaotic time, like I said, for us. My friend had just taken his life and I was struggling with depression, et cetera, and it's just healing up from surgeries. And um, yeah, so we came back and I got on vacation, all these pieces and this idea, um, but before I just planned the exhibition without this centerpiece and had wanted to do an installation, but it wasn't, I couldn't figure out what it was that should be there. And then this idea came and then I just had a couple of days to put together. Um, <laughs> so it was, it was a big risk in one sense, but I really had this like hope and this vision. I was like, no, this is, this Phoenix is going to be in the middle of this, out of this material. That's what's happening. Well, that's kind of perfect for this installation. I think that part of the process is was probably really important to what you were doing, and it turned out amazing. Yeah. All right. Thank well, you. Thank you so much, Sarah. All right. Okay, Rita, we have you up next. Rita Patel is actually a, um, I think I mentioned this before, she is a represented artist with our gallery. So we're excited to hear more from her today. Right. Rita Patel is a mixed media artist inspired by materials, methods, and patterns. She is a builder where the materials work with her to become the art. Her creative process is her personal experience of beauty. She is passionate about her practice and moved to Michigan 14 years ago for studio space and, devote, and to devote more time to her art. She's exhibited her artwork since 2000. Rita is a design, inter, has designed interactive art experiences at the Detroit Institute of Arts in organizations and with her public art. Rita holds a master's in public health from Columbia University Millman School of Public Health with a focus on quality of life. She is trained in conversational leadership by poet David White and is certified in enchantivism and the creative problem solving method. Rita also is a CPA, certified workplace wellness program manager and public health and well being specialist. Rita's, Rita's work asks the question what if we could transform the world by experiencing beauty? This experience is a rich source of inspiration that informs her creative process at the intersection of beauty, well-being, social, emotional, and mental, and creativity. All right, Rita, you can share a screen and take it away. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, share my screen. Okay, can you see the slide? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, all right, thank you. So um, I am going to give a little bit of like my art backstory um, and then um, talk about uh, the piece that's in the exhibition and my process and um, where all of it's going. I try to be organized, but um, I think maybe we all know as creative people, life is not linear, so I might be jumping back and forth. <laughs> Um, so, uh, um, as Katie said in my bio, um, I have a background in public health and wellness, and um, that's one of the threads that runs through my work. And it's actually more than my education. It's really just layered in from the way I was brought up and then my culture. And um, it's, it's like embedded in a lot of different ways and how I see the world. So it's almost something that 
I can't get away from. It's in my DNA. Um, and as far as being an artist, I'm not trained um, formally as an artist, uh, but it's something that I used to say, I've always wanted to be an artist for as long as I can remember, but it's, um, it's more like, I think I've always been one and it's how I see the world. And it's just for me embracing that. Um, and I really started um, uh, going down that path um, about 20 years ago or so, maybe 20, over 20 now, it was 1998, I'm not good with doing calendar math, but <laughs> um, I was actually in grad school for public health and started painting at the Art Student League in New York. And that really um, started opening things up for me. And, um, and the idea of beauty, um, as Katie mentioned, is central is a central theme in my work. Um, and I've never really been able to put words to it until um, the last decade or so. And it's, it's been evolving more and more um, thanks to other people's works that I'll reference in um, as I go through my presentation. And uh, it's, um, it's like I would, I would feel my soul perk up um, with the, the idea of beauty or with any um, experience of beauty that I had. And the first person that really um, uh, helped me embrace it more and make it more over, it was uh, when I heard an interview with John O'Donohue, um, who has a great book. Um, I call it like my Bible, it's tattered and it's on my, um, uh, right next to my computer and it's called Beauty, the Invisible Embrace. Um, so let me move on. Okay, so that led me to um, this question. It's like, what if you could change the world by experiencing beauty? And um, I even, this is actually the back of my business card. So I put it, I put it there because it's, it's, it's like, I'm actually asking the question of everyone I meet. And, and what I mean by that is like, how can our personal and unique experiences of beauty really transform just the way we see ourselves, our situations and our environments? And um, I, I love flowers. You can see um, some pressed flowers here and um, researching beauty and flowers and all that led me to this um, uh, psychotherapist and philosopher who has a book called Beauty and the Soul based on his research. Um, and he writes in there that um, the experience of beauty can change our life and how the ability to appreciate beauty is vital to leading a happy and balanced and satisfying life. Um, it leads to the experience of other emotions, such as gratitude, joy, wonder, um, hope, and love. And then um, in, my, uh, in my research, I was also introduced to the Navajo, Navajo concept of hunsho. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, in it, and in it is a sense of unity um, that really kind of encaps encapsulates like all of who I am and the way um, I was understanding myself, you know, uh, from growing up. And the idea is to um, be at one with and part of the world around you. And it means um, health, beauty, goodness, harmony, and happiness all simultaneously. And this Navajo approach to beauty, which is essential to being well, um, is that the embodiment of beauty and the creation of beauty is the highest achievement and destiny of each human being. And, you know, that really resonates with me and something that I've um, tried to go deeper in. And from my well being practice, um, uh, I've come across the worker Barbara Fredrickson, and um, she's, in, she's a, a positive psychology researcher. And um, she talks about how, although fleeting, um, our emotions, including when we experience beauty, um, just by experiencing them, and the more we experience them, it leads towards a life of flourishing. And, um, and it, it, it really broadens our minds and builds the, our resources, our re resourcefulness in a way um, that uh, helps us become more resilient to adversity and um, achieve what one could only once imagine. So to me, that's like very invitational and, um, and, and that in challenging times, um, beauty is more important than ever. It's not something superfluous. And, um, uh, and so I think I can, I can talk about this forever, but I, I feel like John O'Donohue said it best that the cry of our times is to awaken beauty. Um, and it should not be something we dismiss uh, and, um, 
but really uh, shift our perspective as something of critical uh, importance. And uh, uh, so, so that's kind of the backstory of why beauty and for my work. And um, I'm, I'm hoping to bring the way I experience beauty out into the world for others to experience for the possibility of all of what I just said. Um, and, and so one of the things that has come out of all this work is uh, a process uh, that I've, uh, uh, I, that I teach and that I've um, presented on. It's called Amer Experiments in Beautiful Thinking, where it really starts from a pace of language and um, our words and expanding into um, uh, more abstractness to, to back to our daily lives and how um, it's a way to like enhance our and increase our breadth and depth of beauty um, in your own personal unique way. So it's a, it, the processes lead you into creating your own uh, beauty autobiography. Uh, and for the creative people out there who um, think about this, it's also a way to create a very personal um, visual language and, um, and, and, and then how to ground all of that in your day-to-day, -day, specifically your, the mundaneness of our lives, which is, I feel, predominantly <laughs> most of our life. So um, uh, the process itself, surprisingly, and I don't know why it would surprise me, um, but it actually led me um, very specifically to understand my point of view on beauty. Like what, what of the things that I find beautiful, what, what was the specific quality of it? And what I've learned is through the process is that it, for me, it's defined as lyrical. And I'm, I'm somebody who comes from the headspace of like uh, images and abstractness. So language has always been difficult for me, which is why I focus on it so much. And, and so in looking up lyrical, um, it's the definition is a curve, roundish flowing, it's layered, texture, ethereal, and quirky. But um, it's, uh, it's also for me, um, like looking at this piece, like this one gesture that I've made, um, on here on the left side, it, it's also a gateway into where I, I feel like a, a longing, a yearning, um, this desire to hold on to the fleeting, but then also the, the simultaneous sense of loss and grief. So it's an avenue, my experience of beauty is an avenue for me to really uh, uh, feel my feels. <laughs> and I think that's something that um, at least I don't, and I imagine a lot of people also don't, have that, to have that space to really feel and to feel all of our emotions. And I think that's like the, um, uh, the way that we ultimately feel alive. And uh, a lot of my work is very just gestural. And so movement is a big part of it. And lyrical really captures the type of movement that I am most um, attracted to and most um, uh, inclined to create myself. So, so this is the piece that's um, in, in the exhibition Hope uh, that Katie showed us earlier. And uh, it's called Rainbow Rain. And it's, um, it has that lyrical quality for me. And the, it's visually, it's captured in, in the drips. And uh, this uh, painting was created um, in what I call one of my side pieces. So I'm working on multiple pieces at the same time. And the, the, I don't like to waste stuff and I also like to keep moving. Um, and, and so I, I have other artworks that come out. And in that time period, I had just um, come back to making my art again. Um, I had been really busy with other work in my life. And so I was really excited. And this particular piece was really the ray of light <laughs> that came out of all that because the other pieces were all about what I had been experiencing, uh, which was darkness. And um, something about the color combination um, really helped me um, feel hopeful, like even during the rain, 
before, after, even like it's like time is compressed, there's also the possibility of something else. Um, and the, the, I was about to say the lyrical moment, but the movement of the drips coming down, um, I, you know, it's in a lot of my work. And I, to me, it captures all of the emotions I talked about in the yearning, which I think is part of what, uh, for me, I need to feel and, and feel when I'm also thinking about um, possibility and hope. Uh, and so these are three of my other works and the, it's, uh, this is my home. And the one in the back of against the dark green wall is one that I created in 2008. And the other two black pieces I created this year. And it's, it's interesting how um, once I, reflecting back and now that I've done this like um, reflective work on really understanding what I mean by beauty, that there's, the strokes are similar <clears throat> and the movement is similar. Uh, it's, uh, I thought it was a very different style that I was working in now, but there is this uh, running theme. It's hard to tell in this picture, but there's drips in the back of the white painting and the movement is made um, through uh, multicolored dabs um, and it's of birds flying and the black pieces it's the same thing it's the it's the but it's it's made in a different um i guess medium and uh and and the strokes are made differently but the idea is again the birds flying and for me the in-flight of birds the movement of their wings is like the most beautiful lyrical moment and it's it's very hard to capture because it's gone in a moment as they fly away uh, so it's just to give you some history. And then these are three um, more recent works. So you can see more closely just to give more of an example. Like I work in uh, all different mediums. To me, it's not so much about the medium. It's like what the feeling I'm, and the gesture I'm trying to get across. So again, these are all part of the in-flight series. And I, I feel it all in my heart when I am creating and when it's done and every time I see it. And I'm hoping that uh, that happens for um, those who resonate with it. And, and I think that's, that's uh, uh, well, that's why I create art. I think that's the simplest way to say it. And then these are two other pieces that are um, uh, at Roaring Artist Gallery. And I, just, I wanted to point them out because um, the circle is something I've struggled with as a, as a motif. And, um, but I've started using it a lot, especially during the pandemic, uh, went through a lot with my physical health, similar to Sarah. Um, I was, I've been working with frozen shoulder and trying to reimagine what my body can move like. And, um, and then also um, having limited resources, I was trying to use the materials that I had and was really in conversation with like, well, what do I do with my patterns? I'm also a pattern designer and how does all this work together? I was really looking to feel subtle and cohesive. And what I've noticed is that with these circles, it's not so much the shape itself, it's the arrangement. Like with the previous paintings, um, them all coming together gives me that sense of harmony and balance that comes with the lyrical shape. And, um, and then I feel like, oh, it's, it's emitting some that, those feelings and those emotions for me. Um, and so I, as I just mentioned, I'm a, I'm a pattern designer, I'm a surface pattern designer. Um, I'm really interested in bringing beauty into the places where we live, work and play um, and works beyond um, uh, my paintings and other art that I do. So this is um, a wall mural that I did and it's, uh, I, I really focus on color here. Um, to uh, give that uh, lyrical feeling and movement and maybe feeling more settled. Uh, it was interesting when I made these, I was crying. <laughs> I was like in a deep state of anxiety and um, but I, what came out, I, I feel is kind of soothing. So, um, and then this is just to see further how I translate um, my more fine art work. Um, 
the true gestural creative practice into something that can go on a, a wall. Um, and then I have, as I mentioned earlier, a real um, uh, ongoing relationship with flowers, but particularly the process, the life cycle of the flower, and especially after it's um, had its peak and like the 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 drying and the dying process. That's it. To, I find that just captivating, and I just I love like if you see in the gray and uh, silver uh, tone one the the photograph the 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 petals more in the background how they're like furling and crunching up. Uh, it's it's really interesting to me. And then these are the some of the wallpaper and murals that I've made from that type of work. Um, I feel like I could spend years with this one dahlia flower. <laughs> um, um, and this is some new work that I'm still working on uh, with the florals. Um, these are tulips that I've had for, um, I think now a year and a half, maybe two years. And um, I'm in the process of really trying to capture uh, the, their movements and their arrangement and how they lay and what they do. So this is one that's really captivated me. I thought I'd share that now. So um, you can see like how the petals like curl and furl and it's, it's uh, reminiscent of like the gestures that I'm making um, in the artwork that I've shown so far. And then here's another one. Um, I, it's, I don't know if I'll ever get rid of this flower, but I just I just love every part of this, even the little bud, the way it's hanging and the wisps. And it's like, there's very little um, orchestration here. It's just me laying something down and capturing it. And then I play with color just to see what is highlighted. Um, it's, it's uh, I, I feel like this type of still life is not so still. There's so much energy and movement in it, but capturing the moment is something that I hope um, inspires other people to pause and to experience the, the gorgeousness at every stage um, and, and the uh, fleetingness of it. So um, this is a recent work that I did um, and it's temporary. Uh, I'm going more towards installation right now and with um, materials that are quite fragile. Um, so we have acorns and all sorts of flowers at different stages from pressed to dried to dying to fresh cut. I have some stones um, uh, and really at first glance, it looks beautiful. Um, but the whole, this whole process is for me a lot about letting go. Um, I realized that I'm the, the beauty part of who I am is um, also hoard, hoarding beauty. Um, and so this, besides the temporary aspect of an installation and the materials I'm using, it's also a process of me letting go and seeing how I'm holding on and like how I'm in holding on, for example, and pressing natural um, flora is um, really sometimes um, we're definitely turning into something else, but uh, it's sometimes corrupting it. And is that really the point of all this? So that's really what I'm exploring here. And as beautiful as this looks, there's um, when you get up and up close and personal, you see um, what I still think is beautiful, but it may not be conventionally so. That's which is why there's a magnifying glass here. Um, I'm not sure where all the installation work is going, but um, I'm mining my work and thinking, mining the, all the stuff I've collected over the years between my sticks and stones and dried flowers and all that kind of stuff. And uh, um, I'm starting it in the back corner of my studio, which you probably saw in the background a little bit. Um, and here's just some up close um, that you can see the sunflowers in the bottom left have a little bit of mold growing on them. and just like the pressed lavender with the dried sunflower flowers and the acorns have mold. And <laughs> um, I, I find all of this so interesting. I think it brings me closer to life. It brings me closer to the places and the people who have given me all these items. And then also um, just the interesting aspect of nature and then how it helps me process my own emotions. And I, I I have I have um I have anxiety disorder and I realize a lot of it is is like unprocessed 
emotions like where where and when and how where where am I feeling my feels so I'm moving really towards the direction of slow art um, taking my time with things and really feeling into it and and following that as opposed to um, trying to make something on a timeline and so uh, that's what this is all getting to me and, and just the gratitude that uh, there's just so much strangeness that is so amazing in the world and I don't understand so much and um, and there's just so much so much abundance in that way um, and uh, and then the people who um, share these their beautiful things that they grow and the fact that things grow on our land and the squirrels drop off these walnuts for us on the porch I don't even know why but it's it's a really way to be connected and that was what my whole experiments in beautiful thinking about it uh, uh, the experiments in beautiful thinking process was about is like how it really expands not just our creativity and and connection to beauty but how it leads us into a space of caring not just for ourselves but our our broader community including the environment so here's just another um, little snapshot on like my experimentations and all these um, I guess dried flowers. Uh, some of these are orchids and the rose petals. I mean, some of these are a decade old and I'm not really interested in keeping them pristine so much as um, keeping them and to see what happens. And some of these have unfurled, uh, actually furled onto each other and it's become even more interesting. So it's, uh, it's also playing with like time and, and transformation. Um, and then I really resonated with um, what Sarah uh, talked about in her work with the movement. And, um, and that's like the underpinning in my work at which I had gotten away from and I refound it during the pandemic. And so here's some hanging pieces of Mark making um, uh, Mark and movement work that I've done that has become this kind of sketchbook. For me but also like a place where I can go back and see like what's really happening when I move and what what are the themes and what am I attracted to and all of that so here's here's some a few little quick snapshots and it's really um it's it's what happens when you're not focused on an end product and and the beauty of what arises and so it's really a personal practice it's not necessarily um, uh, uh, something I'm showing. So it's like a, a peek into my sketchbook in a way. And here's some more close-ups. And, and what I'm noticing is like, even no matter what material I'm using, um, it, the, the same gestures are there. And, um, and, I, and or, I'm, or I'm attracted to the same types of things. And, and it's again, the lyrical for me. And it, it can look the same I mean, it can look different, but it's, it, it still has the same essence. Um, and I just can look at all this forever. <laughs> so, um, and that lastly, the movement part, um, that's my painting in the background. And I, um, in going through what I have um, physically recently and, and emotionally, um, I realized that my body has been ignored. I have been ignoring it, even though my background is in wellness and I'm a fitness trainer and all that stuff I wasn't really honoring that pure movement part so I've been taking dance classes and these are really rough shots um, um, they're kind of blurry but it, just to give you an idea I took screenshots from the video that I'm still like with my hands and my body I'm still trying to that's all that's coming out of me is that same um, movement and to me that's beauty so I'd like to, so that's where I'm going. I don't know what it looks like. And I wanted to read this quote, leave it with you, um, is uh, by Krista Ludwig on Franz Schubert. Um, and the quote is, Schubert is so big, so delicate, but what he did was pick a form that looks so humble and quiet so that he could crawl into that form and explode emotionally, find every way of expressing every emotion in this miniature form. And maybe this is all I needed to share with you for my artist talk today. That's, that's what I'm doing. So thank you.
Thank you, Rita. You're welcome. That was uh, that was beautiful. I absolutely uh, I loved hearing more about your process and also more about your philosophy behind your work. I think that was really, really beautiful. And as somebody who's been familiar with your work now for the past year, it's wonderful seeing where you're going. This latest in flight series is just stunning to me. Yeah, thank you. I'm really excited to see what you continue doing. Do we have any questions for Rita? Um, I have a question about, um, also, I, I just have to say, I find it so interesting that you're also a uh, sports instructor and the yeah. movement and um, yeah, the lyrical nature of things. I saw a lot of uh, crossover between our work, even though it kind of seems like beauty and then this just in this uh, lament, you know, but there, there are these overlaps, definitely, like you said, the anxiety and depression. Yeah. That aside, I'm very curious about the performance piece too. Do you have like a link or something somewhere? Was that, or this dance piece, or is that something that you're just still doing for you? Or I'm where is still, that? Um, uh, well, first, uh, thanks for making that comment. Cause that's what I felt listening to your presentation. I'm like, oh, it's the same, but it ex expresses itself differently. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and uh uh, I don't have a link yet because I'm in I'm in that process. I'm in the early stages, so that's why I had just the screenshots. But and to be honest, I was really I was not going to go that direction. But the instructor I have, I can't do it live because she's in India, and I'm here, and so I she she needs me to record myself. So I started recording myself, and I started noticing this. So it's been very organic that way. Um, but I do having um having now when I'm, I'm, i will have something in the future and i'll share it yeah thanks for asking yeah great fun mm -hmm. i'm excited for that that's going to be a really different take on what you're doing and on movements and that's going to be really beautiful yeah and i've always wanted to be a dancer so it's like finally at 51 i'm embracing it <laughs> that's perfect i love yeah. it thank you I also was really taken with the ephemeral pieces that you're doing with your floral pieces. I've seen the floral show up in your art throughout what I've seen of your art, but um, it really, when you were talking about your anxiety and how it like encapsulates that in some ways, I have anxiety as well. That's something, that's one of the biggest things I think that I've had to deal with in my life. And um, one of the things that I feel like helps me the most with anxiety is like visualization techniques. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting looking at those more ephemeral pieces to me, um, how that sort of, I, I don't know, there was some crossovers between what I do with visualization. I think um, it's about connecting, right? It's about connecting to your emotions, about connecting to the world, about grounding and um, connecting to self in a lot of ways through like nature and mm -hmm. diet. And um, I was, I just really loved that you included that. I think anxiety is something I know a lot of artists, a lot of people mm -hmm. deal with and really beautiful to me how you're sharing that with the world. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's something I haven't shared until recently, but I feel like it, the more I share, the more it helps other people. Mm -hmm. I feel that too. I think um, there was a time, I think, whenever I thought that these were things that you're supposed to sort of keep to yourself. Mm -hmm. And the more that I get to know other people, especially other artists, and get out into the world and start connecting with my own art and connecting with other people's art, I think I'm. Um, it's been really beautiful. It's a much more beautiful way to live your life. Really is. Yeah. Feel the feels. <laughs> yes. There's a lot of beauty there. And I love how you are capturing that. Yeah. Your... Thank you. Yeah. Well, do we have any other questions for Rita? All right. Thank you so much, Rita. Thank you. This is great. Yeah. Great. Mackenzie, let me pull up your real quick and um, we will launch into McKinsey's. I'll read your bio and then I'll hand it over. All right, Mackenzie Drake, 
Mackenzie was born and raised in North Carolina. She's no foreigner to sweet tea and the all-inclusive y'all. Just as a side, me either. As an artist and administrator, Drake has experience working in museum and professional studio settings and is the current assistant curator of public programs and community engagement at the Mississippi Museum of Art in Jackson, Mississippi. Prior to this position, Drake completed the William R. Hollingsworth Fellowship at the Mississippi Museum of Art and gained additional experience working at the Digital Resource Center of Rhodes College, Flickr Street Studio, and as an assistant for artists Aaron Harmon and Nancy Cheris. She earned a BA in Art and Political Science from Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee, where she completed the RUCA Civic Engagement Fellowship and was rewarded, awarded the Buckman Fellowship to study abroad at the University School of London's Slave School of Fine Art in London, England. Her work has been shown in local arts venues in Tennessee and Mississippi and is featured in the Rhodes College Permanent Collection. She lives and continues to practice her art in Jackson, Mississippi. All right, Mackenzie, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, I'll share my screen quickly, make sure I can get it to the right screen. Um, hold on just a moment. I might have to switch some screens around, but I'll get there. <laughs> Let me see. Great, and uh, thank you, Katie, for the bio. Um, as she said, I live and work in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, I work at the Mississippi Museum of Art, but I'm also an artist. And here's a little picture of me in my studio with my good cat, pet, friend, child in many ways um, as just a brief introduction. Um, as we saw earlier, this is the work that I have in this exhibition. Uh, this work was actually completed four years ago, um, but I just wanted to start here um, and have you all look at this work and I can talk about it a little bit more. Um, my work is centered on themes of emergence and our, our connection to nature and creating metaphors between uh, different flora and fauna and um, thinking about what it means to live and to um, be in this world. Um, this is one of the few works that include text in the work. And so you can kind of see in the background, um, it says, oh, honey, if they survive the winter, maybe we can too. Um, and kind of going back, you know, thinking about the title of the work, Never Trust a Southern Groundhog. Um, I created this work in the middle of a Southern winter, but a winter nonetheless. Um, and for me, uh, I, I think about the moments of nature, but also moments of ourselves where we're just kind of hanging on, um, uh, sometimes forgotten, but also um, just trying to grow in many ways and emerge. Um, and so never trust the Southern groundhog. <laughs> it's a kind of a um, jovial title of sorts with this work um, to kind of bring some levity to it. But uh, just thinking about um, a long winter and um, kind of hope for the spring, hope that um, you know, we can keep going. So when I saw this uh, exhibition come up, I knew that this was a work that I wanted to submit and show. Um, because that work was done four years ago, I also wanted to show this work as well um, in the same spirit of emergence and working through um, the themes of creating different metaphors out of idiosyncratic images at times, um, uh, what it means to emerge and to grow and to continue searching. Anything. Um, and so you can kind of see here, this is a rather large work. It's a six foot by six foot, 72 inches um, work. And it, I created this work at that scale because it was larger than my physical body or my physical wingspan. 
Um, and so it creates like an intimate relationship and um, has both, uh, it's encapsulating of uh, like me spiritually, but also uh, my physical body as well. Um, and then thinking through like, how are we connected to the earth? How are we not? Um, what ways are we bound? In what ways are we're um, unbound at the same time? How can we um, both live with things and live um, like things as well? Like pieces of nature. Uh, continuing from that theme, I created a few other large scale works. And so this is an install shot of one of the works actually in my house um, with, of course, my cat in front of it. Um, and this work also thought through the theme of how we're bound and how we're less bound. So this one's less earth bound kind of play on that title as well. Um, my work centers both real and imagined spaces um, as this searching, as this emergence. Um, and I'm really inspired by both pieces of beauty of the world around us, um, like the light shining through the trees, the intersections and the edges of water and land, um, or the sky, or just like this, um, the spirit that the world just keeps going, even though you can only see the horizon of it. Um, but I'm also particularly inspired by aspects um, of earth and of life that are um, often misguided or mis um, that we don't we take for granted, we throw away, we cut down um, these pieces like these. Uh, I really enjoy this picture because of the edges and kind of the leaves of the flowers being um, uh, dehydrated naturally in many ways. Um, the cells of it disappearing um, or just changing. And then I'm also inspired by um, figures. Uh, I use figures a lot as representation of self or of um, us as humans, but um, I also enjoy kind of these intersections and these connections um, of how we can treat figures a lot like we can treat the different pieces of the world around us um, and how we are also both found and unbound in many ways um, in the things that we do and create and the impacts that we have on each other and on the landscape. But most of all, I think um, for me particularly, I'm just one person in a big, strange, wide, scary, unbelievable, hopeful, tragic, um, lovely world. And I'm both blended into this space, but I'm also um, detached and can make my own connections as I do. So this is a detailed shot of an image that I'm working on. And I'll show you how that image is progressing. So connected to these different pieces um, and what inspires me, um, I wanted to show you this work, um, which I'm telling that I can misspell the title. It's called The Storm. And it was inspired by, or it was connected to um, a really random storm that we had in Jackson. And um, the kind of narrative behind it is like a tree uh, fell on a friend of mine's house uh, in her place. Um, and then after that storm, I worked, walked back to my house and picked up some of the bright green leaves that had flown off the trees and hit the ground. Um, and so making the connections between um, kind of this figure, all these hands coming, um, but also as the fallen leaves um, connected to it as well. And um, definitely within my work, I want viewers to make their own connections, uh, but um, I'm just working through what it means to 
uh, make these intersections. And here's another work of those intersections and of those metaphors. Um, and I think this is really similar in many ways to the work that I showed um, here in this exhibition. It's called A Thistle of Thoughts. And so within this work as well, making connections between um, one piece of nature and then the real and then the, uh, the intersection of that real and the imagined space um, in order to create a larger metaphor of um, belonging and of hope and reciprocity. Here's another work, um, Walking in My Melodramatic Yellow World, um, featuring uh, a little bit more of a, a realistic figure in many ways. Um, but as you can see, uh, this, this figure is both connected yet um, the composition of it creates this interesting dichotomy of um, who we are and how we're living and walking and meditating in our spaces. Um, here's just a detail shot of that. So you can kind of see the aspects of the background being influenced into the figure itself. Um, since these works, I really, thought about how I can bring back a sculptural component into um, what I'm doing. And so this work, Hanging On and Emerging, um, also thinking through reciprocity metaphor um, in these intersections as well. So you can kind of see the, the hair or the head is being blended into the tree, which comes back around into the figure. Um, this is a direction that I've been working um, on heading into right now uh, and making these a little bit bigger and then connecting these with some of my paintings as well. Um, a few in progress shots of the work that I'm making at the moment. Um, these pictures are kind of, I don't have professional images done yet of these because I haven't shown these um, yet. I'm hoping to in the coming weeks, but uh, here's another work of thinking through um, almost dichotomies, again, uh, the intersections, but also um, I'm really interested in this figure, uh, both as a res representation of me, but also as a um, component of, a visual component of the work um, can, that can kind of symbolize a traveler, a searcher, a wanderer um, in many ways. And I've taken this figure kind of thought through different pieces too. So here's a few of the ceramic works that I'm um, working on right now. So that first work was actually made out of Sculpey and that was just an accessible material that I had um, working full time. It's hard to do a long shot in the studio. So Sculpey was really nice because it's oil-based. Um, but I recently received a Mississippi Artist Commission, um, Arts Commission mini grant and I was able to purchase some uh, clay that I could fire and glaze. And so these are two pieces of this square that um, I'm getting prepped for glazing. And I'm hoping that these will create a narrative through a series, um, thinking about this figure and um, how it can both uh, recede into space. Um, in this like traveling and wandering, um, but can also be uh, something that can mimic um, within the different types of treatment of that surface. Um, so in these, you can kind of see my fingerprint being pushed into the surface, which I think is um, just kind of a really lovely moment. And then also some of these more drawn aspects as well. Um, and here's that in progress shot right now. Um, my work is sometimes really, um, it makes a lot of sense as it moves along, but in many times as well, um, it does take a lot of iterations of that work. Uh, and it's done in a very innate way as well for me. Um, I'm able to respond to a different paint stroke or a different aspect of the work and build it from there. And this is one of the works where I'm hoping uh, to actually combine um, aspects of my ceramic work as like a foreground to this work. So you can see that the bottom is 
patterned, but um, it creates a lot of space. And I'm hoping that some ceramic work can kind of um, help to intersect that space a little bit and bring it more movement as it um, for the viewer. And then here's my contact information. Um, you're welcome to ask any questions after the talk or follow me online. Uh, and I really appreciate this chance to share a little bit more about my work. Um, language is, art is definitely like my visual language. And so connecting it to um, my thoughts and my writing is uh, something that I'm still working on. Um, and I appreciate sharing it with you all. Thank you, Mackenzie. Does anyone have any questions? Do you feel like the um, landscape of Mississippi influences your work in particular um, with your natural elements? I definitely think so right now. Um, I think living in Mississippi is kind of living in kind of a summer camp in many ways. There's, the nature is abundant and it cracks through the pavement. Um, there's potholes in the road that create like magic pieces of portals to forests in many ways. Um, it's an interesting site, um, but I definitely think so here and it is influencing the work. And I'm wondering how that might change as, um, uh, if I stay in Mississippi or if I depart. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting to me. I grew up in North Florida, right below Alabama in the Panhandle. And um, there's a lot of similarities and <laughs> that sort of thing. When you were talking about the portal, I was just remembering um, we used to have, because where I grew up is on top of a cave system. So we would have like sinkholes in places. And I thought that they were like magic portals whenever I was younger. <laughs> but that stuff still influences my work today. So I bet it will continue to influence your work, but I'll be really interested to see if you do end up going somewhere else or if you end up staying there, like what that's gonna continue to look like in your work. I don't have a question, but I just really um, love this idea of what's bound and unbound. And how, as you're talking about it, I am experiencing it in your work. And, and then now talking about the landscape and the porthole, uh, is it portholes or whatever? It's just like these portals. <laughs> um, it, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's triggered something in me. It's very beautiful to look at it, your work that way. Yeah. Knowing that, I should say. I really enjoyed the surrealistic nature also of these landscapes that you're creating. I thought that that was really interesting to see. It feels like sort of like being inside of someone's head, I guess your head. <laughs> Which is a little scary and intimidating, I have to say. <laughs> Welcome. But it's but. really brave to share it. And um, I think that that's a really, really cool thing you're doing. Do we have any other questions? I like your cat. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One thing I wanted to say, these whenever we, um, we send out the invitations for these artist talks, I send out a sign up. So it's always completely random who chooses to be on what day for these talks. But it's always amazing to me to see the crossovers between the people who end up. It's, it's, I always feel like it's, it's not a coincidence who ends up on these talks together. And it's been really cool to see all of you have very yeah. different styles. You do very different things. But um, that, that sort of crossover was really, really interesting to me to see. Mm -hmm. that's what I was going to mention I'm like did you orchestrate this <laughs> <laughs> I did not <laughs> I never have to I just sort of trust that <laughs> it'll work out yeah. yes that's the, the god or the universe it's it's it always ends up being uh, <laughs> yeah the way that it right. is 
it's a really, it is one of the coolest things to me about being able to be part of an art community of an art organization. And um, I love this part of my job. <laughs> so yeah. I thank you all so much for coming and sharing. And it's, it was wonderful to see more of your art and to see more of your processes and to hear more about you. And um, this was a really special time. And I hope that you all felt that way too. But um, thank you. And thank you to everyone who has come to see this and who is, will be watching it later on on YouTube. Um, thank you for supporting these artists and thank you for supporting our organization and the big dreams of artists and what we're trying to do. And um, I wish you all a wonderful day. And thank you all again for being here. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.